church, right? Amen. So last week we talked about church. We talked about um, faith. We've been talking about faith for the last several weeks. We've been talking about faith in action. Last week we talked about faith in action in that um, the church is his people. This is what we learned last week. We're going to take this and kind of run with it um, so that you can figure out where we're going this week. Let me see that first slide if you guys don't mind. We are not spiritual consumers. This is what we learned last week. We are not spiritual consumers. We're spiritual contributors. Now let me tell you something. Restored Church truly is a contributing church, and we are so proud of that. The church is his people. We don't go to church. We are the church. The church does not exist for us. We are the church, and we exist for the world. That is why we are here. Amen? We are here for the world. So that was what we learned last week. And this week, this is where we're going. We're talking about today irrational generous, or, or generosity. Irrationally generous or irrational generosity. Let's take a look at this video real quick before we get started. We know that love gives. We love because God first loved us and gave his son that we could live. Therefore, as a church, we will lead the way with irrational generosity because we truly believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. All right. So how many of you realize it's not just a cliche? It is more blessed to give than to receive. And um, if you doubt it, try it and you'll see. Amen. Um, so we're going to talk today about being irrationally generous. And this is really giving us props and celebrating how irrationally generous that many of us have been. That many of us have been. And taking a look at what the word says, we're also talking about being irrationally generous. We're not just talking about money. So don't sit there and go, I knew it. A church talking about money. Let me tell you something. We are talking about what it is to have a heart that says, God, my life is yours. Everything I have is yours. My family is yours. Everything that I have is yours. And we're talking today about being irrationally generous also with our mercy. Ha ha. How many of you are going to have some difficult holiday dinners this week? Let me see that hand. Mm -hmm. Wow, Hannah is the only one. All right. Um, Samantha and Stephen, we will counsel later this week. Irrationally generous with our mercy. Hannah. Hannah, are you 11? 12. Our 12-year-old 12 is going to have some really difficult holiday dinners this week. That's awesome. I love you, Hannah. You're amazing. All right, go. Hey, guys, let's look at the screen one more time. The Bible says uh, uh, this, the, the first point is God is irrationally generous with us. With Jesus, yep. We, the church, are called to be the same. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 33 and 34. I love this. The Bible says, The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy, um, or needy people among them. Wow. Think about that. There were no needy people among them. Can, can, I, can I give you something today to, to share something with you? All right, guys, get ready. This is the confession of a pastor. Hmm. Uh, last week, the Lord began to, to lay in our heart about um, that verse. Actually, this verse about no needy people among them. Mm -hmm. The Lord spoke to my wife, of course, because I have zero discernment. Oh, I, I almost said amen. I, I stopped myself. Uh, is is there any guy in here today that their wife has like all the discernment in the world and you have zero? Come on, don't leave me hanging. Come on, guys. Bro code. Right. I just, just wondering. Anyway, listen, I have like zero discernment, and, and my wife is completely ate up with it. Uh, so we were praying, and, and actually the Lord spoke to her and said there's a couple people that we need to help. And, of course, me being the, the man or whatever that means, I always tell people I'm the head, but she's the neck that turns the head. Come on, guys, right? Anyway, uh, we, we were praying, and there's a couple of people that, that the Lord laid on our heart. And the first thing I, I started thinking about, well, you know, i gotta, I got to look and see what we've got. Mm. You ever been there, anybody? We began to say, well, and, and then I realized, if see, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm the king of putting things off till later. It's called procrastination. We even use prayer as a means to procrastinate. Lord, oh, I'll, I'll do man. that, but let me pray about it first. Yeah. Benefits in the word, you ain't got to pray, just do it. Come on, guys. So here's what happened. I, 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 uh, there was a couple of people that we were supposed to help, and so what I did was I, I put it off like any other pastor would do, I would think. Then I began to justify. Come on, you've been there, anybody? I justified it and said, well, obedience. man, uh, 
I got to see how much money we got in the account. I'm preaching to somebody. You know, I got to see how much money we got in the account. And then, then, you know, and I realized that delayed obedience is still disobedience. So, man, we were at Steve's uh, get-together at his house, and I pulled Steve and Jason in, and I said, man, as, as your pastor, I just want to say I'm sorry. I said, there's been some areas in my life that I failed in, and, and one is, is when the Lord spoke to me about helping somebody immediately, the first thing I did was, now my heart was right, but Protecting my head wasn't. the church. And I thought to myself, you know what, man, I, I'm, I, I gotta, I'm trying to be a good steward of what God's given us in the account, and, and then all of a sudden I thought, you know what, man, I'm doing nothing but hoarding it up. Come on. And I thought, you know what, man, God gives it to us to get it through us. Amen. I wish you'd help me preach this morning. God gives it to us to get it through us, and, and he'll never bless us if we do not ever let it go from our hand. Remember, if you hold on, you never can receive. A river and a reservoir. Amen. There's a difference between being a river and being a reservoir. See, what happens in the reservoir, you know what it has between it and the river? A dam. I woke somebody up saying that word. <laughs> But you got to realize today that what happens is, is that dam will stop you up, hold you up, and keep you from receiving anything and everything that God wants to bless you with because you've got it all to yourself. Now, let me share something with you. When I finally realized that I was being disobedient by, by having delayed obedience, the first thing I did was stroke a check to a couple of people because we don't need to have any needy among us. Come on. Can I remind you that there's a story in the Bible where the apostles sold everything they had. They put it in one pot and said, you know what? Nobody will have any need because we will meet that need because God has blessed us to supply that need. Yes, Amen. And that is what the church is supposed to be. That's what the church has been designed by God to be. Come on, guys. We are the storehouse to be able to give to other people. The Lord spoke to me and said, are you too greedy to help the needy? Oh, my. Are you too greedy to help the needy? Mm. So uh, he got me pretty good. But here's the cool thing. When you give, you also receive. Yeah. Man, you know, I, I justified and said, man, Lord, I don't have any tires in my truck. There, uh, one is bald. I got a spare tire on the back of my truck. Man, the wires are showing through. I, I was trying to plead with God. Have you been there, anybody? Come on, Come on I know I'm not just preaching to myself today. So what happened is, man, we, I, I, God is my witness. Stroked the check to two people that, that, that were in need because... When a need, you sow a seed. I was a need, and guess what happened? I had a neighbor call me the other day and said, man, I got four tires almost brand new I want to give you. Michelin's. Amen. Michelin tires. If you don't shout, I will. Come on, guys. They're good ones, too. <laughs> They're Michelin. They're good. Michelin. They're great tires, right? God's a good God, but listen to me. You can't outgive him. When a need, I challenge you. Sow a seed. See what God does in your life. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. All right, so because we are an irrationally generous church, I want to show y'all what you guys did for these 86 families. Can I see those um, two pictures of the back room of Anthony's office, please? <laughs> guys, that is, that is only a part of it. The next picture, it's only a part of it. That's only a part of it. There are two bikes and a computer not added to that. And some of you are going to go, huh, there's a computer, there's two bikes? Yeah, because somebody put on their angel that they had a need for that. Uh, they have several children in the home, and they have no computer for the children to do their homework with. And one of our people intentionally took that off of the tree and said, we're going to go ahead and provide that. And every single <laughs> gift is such a huge blessing, guys. Such a huge blessing. We want to thank you for providing. We want to thank you for what you did in the Thanksgiving, feeding 60 families, entire dinners uh, for Thanksgiving, and then we turned around and we're going to bless them all over again. This is not giving us props, it's giving God props of what he's done in us because we have a heart to serve and to be the community, to be a house of blessing, to be a place where, listen, the, this community may not even know we're here because, listen, we snuck into this place when it still looked like a crack house. Yep. And, and we started doing, cleaned it up and started doing church before we ever advertised to anybody that we were here. They may not know that we still haven't advertised. We, we, they may not know that we're here, but they're beginning to know that we're here. And the more that we begin blessing the community and the more that we begin being the church, not just coming in here and having church, but being the church, 
the more that people will say, oh, you know what? That restore church. And it's not about us. We want to be that church that if we were to move out of town, they would miss us. That they would say, but, but they truly provided. They truly cared about us. They knew that we were here. Somehow they heard our prayers. And the things that I said in my bedroom to the Lord, and they showed up. We want to be the church that if we were to leave town, not that we are, but that they would miss us. That is the goal. That is the goal. Let's look at Proverbs 14 and 31. The Bible says, he who is generous to the needy honors God. Yeah. Come on, that's good stuff, man. Generous is, listen, guys, generous is not what we do. Generous is, generous is who we are. Yeah, Let me on. share something with you. Generosity brings blessings. Hey, what's the blessing? Come on, man. Generous people will be blessed, Proverbs 22 and verse 9. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 15, 10, give generously. Then because of this, God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and 8. God loves the one who gives gladly. Mm. Come on, man. What's the Bible say? God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And God will make it up to you by giving you everything you what? You need. Come on, guys. And more so that there will not only be enough for your own needs, but plenty left over. Man, I'm about to shout. To give joyfully to others. See, here's a cool thing. Remember, you're a river. God gives it to you to get it through you. You're not a reservoir. So it can just be all held up for you. See, when you begin to believe, when you begin to give, God allows you to live under an open heaven, meeting your need and everybody else around you. Can, can we pull this out of just financially? How many of you have ever given someone time when you didn't have time? And you notice that somehow you had more time that week <laughs> to be able to do the things that you had to do. It was like God multiplied it. If you know anything about rivers, when it gives out, it doesn't go dry. It somehow continues to flow. So when we give out time to people, when we have a need in our own lives and we meet the need in somebody else's, God miraculously, miraculously touches the needs in our life. It is so good how God works. Generosity increases happiness. So listen, the more that you begin to serve and love on people and be the church, look to be more happy. Because there is nothing more miserable than spending time with a person who is all about themselves. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. I wrote a book called Get Over Yourself. I had the audacity to do that. Why? Because I had to get over myself. My whole life was spent on me, me, me. My hurts, my problems, my issues, the people that hurt me. And God finally said, listen, it's time to get over yourself. I want to use you, but you've got to get over all the hurt, the pain, the shame, the junk that you're stuck in so that I can use you to bless other people. That's what you're here for, and it's time to get up over yourself and move on because I want to use you, I want to bless you, and that's where your happiness will come. We don't wait for happiness to come so we can give out. We start giving out so we can get happy. Yeah. Anybody with me? Yeah. Amen? <laughs> Acts 20, 35, there's more happiness in giving than receiving. Generosity also expands your influence. Those who give generously to those in need will never be forgotten. Yeah. Psalm 112 and verse 9 says this, they will have influence and honor. Guys, some of the largest appointments, if I can say this without, some of the places that God brought me was from nothing more than a seed that I'd sown into a ministry when nobody was watching and when I didn't think that ministry was watching. Some of the biggest blessings in our lives, in our ministry, came because somewhere along the way, God laid it on our heart to find a ministry that was in need. We gave to them, and then a couple years later, they came back and said, would you come speak for us, or would you come minister for us, or would you come? Sometimes, and let me tell you what the Bible says in Proverbs, that your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. Sometimes when you sow a gift, when you put time into some uh, relationship, when you give out of yourself, God increases your influence. God opens doors for you that you cannot open. And he will make a way where there is no way. Always. Keep going. Multiplies. Generosity multiplies your money and you receive resources. more resources. Yep. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven twenty five, a generous man will prosper. 
He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Come on, guys. You reap what you sow, right? Yep. yep. St. Corinthians 9, verse 11, you will be enriched so that you can give more generously. Let, let me share something with you. There is an awesome story, uh, and this actually is a model of an irrationally generous church. And, and it's found in 2 Corinthians. And, and let me give you the backstory if I could quickly. Um, we find out that Paul was actually raising money, if you will, um, for the believers in Jerusalem. It was, like their, it was like their headquarters. And what Paul did, he went to, um, he was at Corinth, the church at Corinth, which he had established. And, and see, what happened is I, I, I began to do a little bit of research and, and digging and, and found out that the Corinthian believers were a very wealthy church. They had all the material uh, materials uh, or, or the, uh, the monetary means to do anything they wanted to do. They had pledged and promised a gift to Paul, but when Paul came to deliver, they began to have second thoughts. Hmm. Have pa you been there anybody? themselves out of it. See, what happened is they probably looked at the budget and said, I don't know if we can afford that. Mm. They probably thought, well, you know what, I don't know if I'm being a good steward because we pledged and, you know, we, we got bills due and everything else. So I don't know if I can give this gift to further the ministry to the saints in Jerusalem. So, you know, Paul, I don't know if I can do what I said I could do. They overpromised and underdelivered. Mm -hmm. So Paul, speaking to the Corinthian believers who were a very wealthy church, started giving them an example of the Macedonian church. And I love this, man. I, I've read a commentary that... The Macedonian church uh, was founded by Paul in the second missionary journey. And here it was in, in this land, uh, Macedonia, where Paul had established a church. All around was a very wealthy, thriving, prosperous place. This land was known for two things, for timber and for precious metals. It was actually located right there in, in, the, uh, in a plain, the stretch right on the Gulf of Thessalonica. One of the most beautiful and wealthiest places in the ancient world. And Paul had planted a church right here. How many know that when you plant a church in a wealthy air, area or neighborhood, you think it's going to be wealthy, right? Just the exact opposite. Mm. These were a bunch of poor people. They were very, uh, they, they had lived in poverty. And, and I love it because here's what happened. Let's look at verse 2. The Bible says, in the midst of a very severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Did you oh hear that? Oh, my. <coughs> they didn't look at the budget. Come on. They didn't think, well, Lord, if I give this, I'm not going to have anything left over for me. Oh, come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good somebody. You're awful quiet this morning. Come on, you ain't shouting nearly as loud as I'm preaching today. Look, let's look at it again. In the midst of a severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Then Paul said, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able, but listen, they didn't stop there, and even beyond their ability. Wow. Are you hearing me? Over and above. Look, man, th these were not the wealthy guys. These were not the people with a, with a, a, a multi-million dollar temple back in the day. These were guys that were meeting probably yeah. a house. And, and the, though the area was wealthy around them, man, they didn't have a pot to cook in. Where's your mind today? <laughs> Got you on that one. Man, these were poor people. They didn't have anything. But Paul said they gave regardless of yep. what they had. I love it because he said they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Watch this, entirely on their own. You know, Paul didn't come to get a gift from them. But instead, before Paul left, they said, man, I know you didn't ask for a gift. I know you didn't beg for a gift. But we're begging you to let us give you a gift so you can take it and give it back to the saints in Jerusalem because they had a need. I love it. Entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the what? Privilege. Privilege. Get out of your mind today. The privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And Paul said, and they exceeded our expectations. Like we did. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. Here's the key. 
You've got to give yourself first to the Lord. Listen, you can't give your substance until you first give yourself to the Savior. Amen. Come on, somebody. Come on. See, when you belong to the Lord, you look for ways to give instead of excuses not to give. Mm. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then, by the will of God, gave also to us. But since you excel in everything, this one to the Corinthian believers, but since you excel in everything, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. <clears throat> you can't out give God. They were so poor. They had no monetary means whatsoever. But what they did have, they gave to him to further spread the good news of the gospel so they can continue to go on mission trips and take the gospel all over the world. Amen. That is irrationally generous giving when it comes to giving to God. Can you say amen? amen. amen. That's what you and I need to endeavor to do today. If you believe that, give the Lord a huge hand clap. Come on, guys. <clears throat> All right, Anthony confessed. Here's my confession. Ready? Um, he's way more generous than I am. Way more generous than I am. And you're going to say, but he just said that he wasn't. See, here's the thing. With our own personal money, he's super generous with. But with church money, because his mentality is this isn't my money, this is our money, I have to be such a good steward of this, and I don't want to screw this up. Y'all better thank God for a pastor that walks in a way that he says, Lord, I am trying to do everything that I know to do. You've heard us say it. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw some things up. But you will hear that we will be the first one to admit it because we are trying to find the way to go at every step, just like we expect you to do as well. Here's the thing. As far as with generosity... He's one of those people that is truly happy for other people when they succeed. I'm going to get on your business this morning. You know I am. Because some of you just went, mm, I got a problem with that. When other people succeed, all I do is look at how I'm not. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today before we wrap this up. But I want you to understand what's happening in this place because I don't know this to be 100% fact. But, but Paul, I would assume, is, was a lot like me in that when he could see that they were destitute, when the Macedonians were destitute, when they were literally dirt poor. Imagine that he went to that area and he didn't ask them to give. How do I know that? Because they came to Paul and begged him, please let us give in this offering. Please let us be a part of that. And the reason why I know that that's probably what happened is because there have been times I've looked at my husband and said, Anthony, you can't go to our people one more Sunday and ask them to give again. You just asked them two weeks ago to give for Thanksgiving. And now we're going back to them where we're asking them to give all over again for Angel Tree. And then there was a need that came up and he said, I'm just going to go to the church and ask for it. And I said, but Anthony, I'm, we know the financial situation of a lot of our people. You can't ask them for a blessing. I believe that this is where Paul was with the Macedonians, where he said, listen, I'll go to the rich guys and ask them for an offering. I'm not going to bother those that are dirt poor and struggling. What was awesome is that those that were average dirt poor or struggling, ran up to Paul and said, no, 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 don't ask somebody else. I need a blessing and I want to give. That's awesome to me. That's awesome to me. And I want to tell you who that reminds me of. Listen, I showed you the gifts on our back. And, um, and I showed you the pictures. And we've got two bikes uh, uh, that have not been added to that. But it put me in mind of this. And I just sent this to Andy this morning because it was so on my heart. There's a church that I've preached for out in Rockland, California. It's called Destiny Christian Center. This place is a mega church today. But how many of you know that you don't get mega before you get mighty, mini and mighty, right? You've got to get a vision and you've got to start somewhere. Listen, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to want to jump on to restore church later. It's all of us that are rolling up our sleeves here going, hey, I see the vision. I get what God wants to do. If we continue to be the church, God will continue to bless us. That is where we're at today. One of my dearest friends, Kathy Farrington, her and her pastor, Greg, 
uh, pastor this church called Destiny Christian Center out there in Rockland, California. And when I went out with her there a couple of years ago, I did a, a ladies' meeting for her, ministered for them uh, a few times, a couple times, speak to her, and awesome couple. But when they started, they didn't start in an arena where they are right now. When they started, they weren't doing angel tree and Christmas blessings the way they are today. They started small. Let me show you what 2015 looked like for them as far as blessing their community. Andy, can you play that video for me? I want to thank Destiny Church to make this a very special Christmas for so many children. There is no way on earth that we would have been able to do something like this for our child ourselves. The other mothers out there will know what kind of heart that's touching. This means a lot and thank you very, very much. Thank you for my bike and Merry Christmas. Thank you for my bike and Merry Christmas. Thank you.
2016, 900 volunteers, 4,000 bikes. Show that picture, 4,000 bikes, 900 volunteers, and her shirt says, Love Our City. That's their campaign. They're known to be the church who is a house of blessing. Pastor Farrington always says it. We are a house of blessing. We are here for the world. They get it. Amen? Amen. They get it. And when I talk to, to Kathy, she says, we didn't start like that. We started like that in a back room. We started with two bikes and a bunch of toys. We started with a vision. We started with people getting a hold of understanding that this is not about us. Listen, if I'm turning you off with Restore Church because you're like, look, I came in here to be fed and to give me, give me, give me, this may not be the place for you. I love you and I will love on you, but at some point, your happiness is not in getting more. It is in finding that your life is more purposeful than just hanging out and warming up a bench. Amen? That's awesome to me. And I'm not, I, I don't want to, I, I was so careful this morning when I was praying about this because, Lord, I said, God, I don't want to um, uh, demean what we're going to do this afternoon at 4 o'clock by showing them that. And he says, no, no, they understand and they'll get the fact that in order to get there, you start somewhere. Yes. See, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. We put our weight in things instead of walking by faith and putting our weight. Do you know what it means to glorify God? Let me hang out with you just for a second. The word glory means weight. W-E-I-G-H-T, weight. Glory is weight. When you glorify God, you're putting weight in who he is. You're putting weight or stock. It's like putting your, all your eggs in one basket. Are you with me? It's like putting stock in one thing. I bet on Jesus over my stuff. I need you to hear me. Here's the problem is that instead of sometimes putting our weight or our, our glory into the faith side. Instead of putting it here, what we do is this, is we put it over here with facts. Well, I bet you Paul did this with the Macedonians. Well, let me look at the facts. They're broke. I'm not going to ask them to give. They're hurting. Life is about them right now. I'm going to let them wallow in it. I have a feeling that they'll be offended if I come to them. I fear. Come on, guys. That's where I am sometimes. I fear. Somebody said to me last week, I appreciate your message last week. That was a really touchy subject. And I said, it was? Yeah, you preached on, on giving and, and, and being the church. And, and I said, wow, I'm glad I didn't know it was such a touchy subject. I would have dealt with it differently. I just came in here and just spoke the word of the Lord, and I believe that this is who God would have us to be. You see, some of you are here today, and instead of putting your weight on who God is and on what God has said to us, you put your weight on your feelings. You put your weight into your fears. You put all your weight into the facts. I don't have time. I don't have time. I'd love to, but I don't have time. We do this all the time. Some of us, we put all of our weight into our past failures. God can't use me because I know my track record. And even though I may fake it well in church, no one knows there who I truly am. Can I say this to you? With a loving heart. Get over yourself. There is nothing that you could possibly do that is bigger than my good God. Amen. There is nothing that you can screw up that God cannot redeem. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is, we are not more important than God. We are not. Uh, our sin is not greater than the blood of Jesus that washes us clean. We are nothing compared to his grace and his mercy and his love. And see, sometimes what we do is we put all of our weight into stuff. You know what? I want to do ministry, but I really can't right now. i got to do all this stuff so it can prepare me for ministry. Man, we have been there. 
And you know what God says? Do ministry and I'll provide for you. This is what God says. Stop putting your weight in your fears, in your feelings, in all of your failures, in all of your past. Stop putting your weight there and put it in who I am. Give me glory by weighting down. And, and if you're going to measure something, at least make me bigger than your fears. If you're going to weigh me out, make me bigger than your feelings. If you're going to weigh me out, make me bigger than your facts. I know what it says on paper, but am I not bigger than that, God says. Sometimes all we do is we look at our faults. And we said, Lord, but here's where I am right now. And this is where I'm at. And I want to be here, but this is where I'm at. And God says, no, 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 no. When you give me glory, it's when you put your weight on me. You give me stock in who I am. And no matter what the facts say, and no matter what our feelings say, and no matter how we justify, and no matter how we reason it out, and no matter how we write it on paper, and no matter how it is that we do any of these things, what matters is God is more valuable, more important, and more able than any of that junk right there. Anybody with me? You see, the problem is, is that for some of us, and this is why we needed to go here today, this is really not about giving. It's about defeating something called a scarcity mindset so we can start living in an abundant mindset. Guys, this is me. In a lot of pieces and a lot of parts, this is me. There's two videos back to back I want to talk to you about. Scarcity mindset, abundance mindset. God says we got to squash this one and we got to walk in this one because that is where I can use my people to bless people with time and energy and effort and the resources that I give them to get it through them. Like, let's take a look at two very old commercials. Very old commercials. But they set up perfectly the difference between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. Let's take a look. <laughs> Ruffles potato chips, huh? You suppose I could have one? If I give one to you, I have to give one to everybody else. <laughs> okay, it's 2 a.m. and you're staring at that bag of Doritos tortilla chips and you're asking yourself those middle of night questions like, did I get up just to eat these? Or am I just eating these because I'm up? I don't know. Doesn't matter. The point is Doritos are there and so are you and one of you ain't leaving until the other one's gone. Look, Cool Ranch Doritos are great, but they're not worth losing sleep over. So if you want to get back to bed, do yourself a favor and crunch all you want. We'll make more tomorrow. Anthony admitted that he was struggling with this this week that's what it was he said to me Jen if we give to these two families that need help they're gonna start coming out of the woodwork we're given all these angel tree people and now my phone is ringing off the hook with more people that need help and it's freaking me out a little bit and so he had to go Lord you are a huge God and if you want to provide, then provide. That's right. There will never be enough. Come on, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but for some of you, that's you. Yeah. I am like this with cinnamon sticks from Pizza Hut. <laughs> Is it Pizza Hut? <laughs> Listen, if I say I'm ordering Pizza Hut, just leave because I'm going to offend you. <laughs> I'm going to order cinnamon sticks, and when they get here, I'm going to take them. I'm going to hide them so that you can't get to them. And that makes me sad <laughs> because I shouldn't be that way. You can have a cinnamon stick. The problem is, is there's only 12. 
And chances are you won't just take one, you'll come in and like Cole Richardson, you'll take like five. <laughs> because some people don't understand that. And so I hide them. And then I feel guilty later. There's not going to be enough. And if I give one out, I've got to give one to everybody. And Jesus says, that's okay, because my abundance thinking I own the cattle on a thousand hills. We can make more. Yeah. We can make more. If you have a scarcity mindset, you compete to stay on top. If you have an abundance mindset, you collaborate to stay on top. You know that if the team wins, we all win. Scarcity thinking hoards things from others. Cinnamon sticks. Abundance thinking is generous with others. We'll make more. We'll order more. And I say, but it'll be later, and I want them now. Scarcity th thinking says, I won't share my knowledge with you. You'll steal it and take credit for it. Mm. Abundance thinking says, I'll share my knowledge with you and you can take credit for it. That's fine because I'm really not about that. Mm, my Lord, I just stomped on some of you. <laughs> Scarcity thinking says, I won't offer my help to others because then they're going to suck away my time and then I'm going to have none left. Abundance thinking freely offers help to others. Scarcity thinking is suspicious of others all the time. They don't build rapport. They're always just suspicious of people. They're always looking at their motives and trying to figure out what they're really about. Abundance thinking trusts and builds rapport with people and gives them the benefit of the doubt. If you've ever been around Anthony long enough, you know that he will always find the right in somebody, not the wrong. Resents competition. If you're one of those that when competition comes in, you bow up and start getting territorial, you need to start chipping away at yourself. You need to start letting God work on your heart and say, hang on a second. When the team wins, we win. Territorialism has got to get squashed. Resist competition, but abundance thinking welcomes competition. Scarcity thinking says, I'm afraid of being replaced. Abundance thinking says, I want to strive to grow. Scarcity thinking says, I believe that rough times are coming. Always that person, gloom and doom, man, things are going too good. Something's got to be coming wrong. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but some of you are that way. Things are going too good. It's something's gotta, something bad's coming. You all right, Stephen? No, no. <laughs> Believes that times are tough and worse times are coming. Abundance thinking says, but the best is yet to come. If God can bless me in the past, he can bless me again. And no matter what I go through, God will be in it and I'm going to the next level. Believes that the pie is shrinking. <laughs> Believes that the pie is growing, abundance thinking. Scarcity mindset thinks small and avoids risks. Two weeks ago, we said that the church is a church that is bold in their faith and takes risks knowing that our God is bigger than the little box that we put them in. Abundance thinking thinks big and embraces risk because we understand this, that if God is not in it, you see, if we're, if we're trying to accomplish anything and we can do it on our own and we don't need God, it ain't God. Because God wants to be needed. We need God. So we want to believe for something that's bigger than ourselves. Scarcity thinking fears change. Abundance thinking takes ownership of change, embraces it, and understands that God is the God of good and of change, and he is there with us, and he is for us. So I'm just going to ask you, on a 1 to 10, are you less generous? Are you more generous? On a 1 to 10, I don't need to know. On a 1 to 10, are you a scarcity thinker? Are you afraid? Are you a hoarder? Are you a river or a reservoir, pastor says? One to ten. You're like, can you wrap this sucker up, please? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Go for it. All right, let me give you five quick things. How to live generously and in abundance. Number one, you ready? Remind yourself that there is more than enough and stop complaining. That's right. Comparing. And comparing. I took that, that was free. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes, it did. Carefully select, they're supposed to be the first one up there, guys. 
Second one is this. Carefully select your friends and the company that you keep. Mindsets are contagious. Number three, give more of what you want. You reap what you sow, what we said a minute ago. Be a river, not a reservoir. And listen, but we live in a day and time where where we have a scarcity mentality. Man, I was taught when I was little, get all you can. Mm -hmm. Can all you get. Sit on your can. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? But let me, let me share something with you. John Wesley, the, the, uh, the mighty uh, preacher back in the, back in the day, here's what he said. He said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, and all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That's good. That's what we're supposed to do. That's good. How to live generously in an abundance mindset? Practice gratitude for what you do have. Yeah. Practice waking up in the morning and counting your blessings instead of what you don't have. Yeah. For some of us, that alone will set us free in big, big ways. And then Anthony says, count your wins. And then lastly, choose to give glory to God. What does glory mean? It means weight. weight. Choose to give glory to God and put weight in his word and what he says. And we're going to wrap up with this because I feel like I need to help you this week. For some of you, you're going to be around loved ones. You're going to be around family members. You're going to be in, in places where it's going to be difficult to extend grace to someone, to give mercy to someone. Come on, what's grace? Grace is giving something to someone that they do not deserve. Mercy is not giving them what they do deserve. Right? Grace is giving them what they don't deserve, and mercy is not giving them what they do deserve. We deserve death and damnation for who we are, for what we do, for sin. But by the mercy of God, he gives us what we don't deserve. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. He gives us mercy. He gives us grace. And so this is what I want to share with you today. Ephesians 2 and 4 says this, that God was generous in mercy and love. So here's how I'm going to help you today. You're going to get over here, and you're going to be around somebody, and you're going to be irritated and agitated with them, and you're going to be watching them, and you're going to be watching how they act, and you're going to re be remembering all of the ways that they failed you. You're going to be looking about at the facts of that person. You're going to be looking at your feelings towards that person. You're going to be putting stock or weight into their failures. You're going to be putting stock or weight into their faults. You're going to be looking at them and counting all the ways that you want to punch them in the throat. In Jesus' name. You're going to want to tell them off. You're going to be putting weight into their faults, into their failures, into all the things that they've said and done to you. And you're going to sit there and you're going to stew. And God's going to ask you something real simple. I need you to be generous with mercy. I need you to put your weight into who I am. That I am a God that is rich in mercy and love, and I need you to be too. That I am a God who looks and sees what's right with someone, not what's wrong. That I am a God that understands that everyone is a work in progress and that I promise to complete what I started in them. He's going to say, I need you to not look at your feelings or your fears that they'll hurt you all over again or the facts of what they've done to you before or last Christmas. I need you to make sure you're not walking into that place already reciting and rehearsing and nursing what happened last year so that you could do it this year and tell them off or put them in their place. God says, I want you to put your weight in your faith. Put your weight in me. Put your weight in who I am and put your weight in my word put your weight there it'll bring me glory it will bring me honor and I can accomplish something far greater with the mercy that you extend to another than the lecture that you give them this Christmas when people fail you make no mistake about it they are well aware they know 
when you mis make a mistake, do you know? Does anybody have to tell you? We know. And oftentimes, it's the shame and the pain and the regrets and the guilt that we feel that causes us to be that much more angry, evil, and uptight. So when you come across somebody that's angry, evil, and uptight, perhaps it's the junk going on on the inside of them because they are well aware of how they failed you before. And in your presence, it reminds them. It reminds them of who they don't want to be. Let's be rich in mercy and in love this holiday. Amen. Let's be generous in everything that we do because that's who we are. Yeah. It's not just what we do. Yeah. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. So we're just going to wrap up today. We're going to wrap up today with Siri. Siri is with us. I feel, I feel her presence. Good thing is, is that Jesus is with us as well. And the Holy Spirit is here to just love on us and to convict us. Can we, can we get something straight? When God convicts us about something, don't be mad. Don't get upset. The Bible says that God chastises them that he loves. When I beat my children, it's because I love them. <laughs> when I spank their tail, it's because they need it. And because I when you wear a kid out for walking in the street, it's because you love them enough and you want them to live. So listen, if you're here today and, and, and you there's been some, some stepped on toes or we've kind of poked around on some stuff or I just told you that you have a scarcity mindset and you didn't even know it, this is when you go to God and say, Lord, deal with me, help me. Don't let the feelings get in there. Don't let fears get in there, especially with the blessings that God has for you. Don't look at your circumstances and go, oh, I've got I've to pull it back. No, it's when you're in need that you go, God, I'm just going to give my way out of this thing because you're going to have to open doors for us. You're going to have to provide for us, and I trust you. So no matter where you are, whatever's going on in your heart, be thankful that God is a God who loves us so much. How are you? <laughs> and so he can provide for us a new table. Um, <laughs> kidding, that's supposed to do that. So let's just pray. Let's just make it super simple today. And let's just pray that, God, would you help me? Would you help me with my scarcity mindset? Would you help me to realize that you are such a bigger God than the, than the God that I make you, that, the box that I place you in? You're the God that wants to lavish your, your children with good things. Not only because you love us, but because you trust that you'll not only get us to us, but through us into this world. Lord, help me with my scarcity mindset that I don't sit here as a child of God and be stingy. That I don't sit here with grace and not extend it to a loved one this, this, um, this, this Christmas. That I don't sit here and be stingy with the mercy that you've given me, that I wouldn't extend it to another. Let us be able to say, Lord, don't let me be stingy with my time. Don't let me be stingy with my, my heart. God, I know that I get hurt from people, and I know that they mess me up and mess me over sometimes. But God, don't let me call myself a Christian and be stingy with my love or my compassion towards people. God, use me. Use us. Let that be our prayer today. Let that be our prayer today. What are you guys about to do? Let's just end it today with the first song that you did. Um, you make me brave. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. For some of us, we just need to ask God for courage. God, give me the courage to believe that you are my provider, not me. I am not providing for myself. Come on, some of us... Our, our, our scarcity mindset is because we are steeped down and we don't even realize it in thinking that we are self-made. That the income that we make is because we're just that good. We don't even realize sometimes that we are steeped down in selfness. 
providing for ourselves and having that we don't recognize that God is the God that gives us a job, that gives us breath in our lungs to wake up and go do that job. He is our provider. And for some of us, we just need courage to say, you know what? I'm going to let you have some of my cinnamon sticks. <laughs> I'm, I need courage today. God, you make me brave. The next time I order them, make me brave enough to give. Make me brave enough to put myself last and other people first. And some of you are going to only remember cinnamon sticks today. But I need you to get this. Let God make you brave. Because he's a big God. And he wants us to walk in big faith. And he wants to use us in big ways. And everything that we do and everything that we give was his to begin with. And we don't have to fear that it will be gone because our God is a multiplier and he will give it all back to us. Yeah. He will give it all back to us yeah. and he will not forget what we've done. Yeah. Let's go ahead and pray as they begin playing this song. Father, I thank you today for your word. You make me brave this morning. You make us brave this morning. You do that. God, give us the courage today to extend grace and mercy to somebody in the next couple of days who does not deserve it because neither do we. Give us the grace and the courage and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the strength that we need today to be generous with our time and our effort and our energy and our attention. God, we're going to be sitting across the table from someone who so longs to just have the attention of somebody. And that is going to drive us insane. But God, you want us to sit there and to just give them attention. You want us to just sit there. That's for somebody today. I don't know who it is, but you're going to find yourself at a table and there's going to be somebody across from you that just wants to talk. And everything on the inside of you is going to be screaming, get me out of this table. <laughs> and God is saying to you, be generous with your time. Be generous with your heart. All they need is compassion. All they need to be is heard today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would make us brave and that you would make us givers, and that you would make us generous with what we have so that we can meet the needs of others that you place around us in the next coming days. Bless those that give. Bless those that have put you first. And God, bless us as we desire to bless you today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus